Hello there, I'm Neve Brannigan and welcome to the Irish Film London podcast. I'm flying solo today without Jerry, so I won't keep you too long before we tuck into today's brand new episode. So, quick recap. The Galway Film Flat kicked into full swing last weekend with some incredible shorts, features and documentaries. Our top picks here at IFL were Stacey Gregg's Here Before, which won Best Film. Best Documentary went to Kim Bartley's terrific Pure Grit. The Tierna McBride Award for Best Fiction Short went to Saul and I, written and directed by John Beer, which also stars my pal Tony O'Rourke, who chatted to us on one of our most recent podcasts about self-taping and the acting industry. So if you haven't listened to that yet, definitely check it out. Who We Love was an absolute gem of a film with a stunning performance from Clara Hart, who also had her own short in the flat called Fox Glove, directed by Michael David McKiernan, who has also graced us with his presence on the IFL podcast previously. And another personal favourite of mine was Dave Tynan's short The Colour Between, starring Jade Jordan and Terry O'Neill. So if you're listening to this podcast on our YouTube channel, you have the option to comment below and let us know what you thought of this year's flat. But congratulations to all of the films and documentaries involved in this year's flat. The standard was incredible and I'm already looking forward to next year. And also remember listeners, if you're in London, we're hosting some film screenings along with some Q&As very soon in the Rio Dalston and the Bertha Dock House. We're screening Dating Amber, The Eighth, Songs for While I'm Away, Wolf Walkers and a shorts program. So definitely get your tickets now. Now, on to our podcast. We are going back to one of our St. Bridget's Day Festival events where Jerry and an IFL audience sat down with Irish director and Irish Film London patron, Lenny Abramson, to chat about his award-winning film room and his hit TV series, Normal People. Just before I hand you over, we'd like to thank Culture Ireland and the Irish Emigrant Support Programme for their ongoing support of our work, including this podcast series. Enjoy, folks. Hello, everyone, and um, thank you for joining us um, on a Monday evening for another uh, Irish Film London event. Tonight, we're talking to Lenny Abrahamson, who is, um, as I hope you know, a, a wonderful Irish director um, who's made uh, a lot of amazing work, but he's also uh, an Irish Film London patron. Um, and thank you, Lenny, for taking the time to join us and nice. for uh, for coming tonight. Um, Thank you to all our funders and supporters, patrons, uh, champions, and everyone else who's uh, who's here to consume a little bit of Irish film content this evening. The reason we're here is because uh, this weekend and Monday and Tuesday is part of our St. Bridget's Day film events. So we're here in the context of celebrating uh, St. Bridget and uh, St. Bridget's Day weekend in conjunction with the Irish Embassy here in London. Uh, and in association with a number of other cultural organisations who are doing this uh, across London and across the UK and, and indeed in many other places. Room is playing as part of the uh, as part of the Galway selection and hence Lenny has come here to talk to us uh, tonight a little bit about Room, about what it means uh, for him in the context of the St Bridges Day celebrations and, uh, and everything else that he's up to as well. So before we start talking about that and say hello to Lenny, I want to play you the trailer for Room to remind us all well, what we're talking about. One evening when the sun went down And the jungle fire was burning Down the tracks came a hobo hiking And he said, boys, I'm not turning I'm headed for a land that's far away <laughs> Beside the crystal I guess they still can't hear us. Do you remember how Alice wasn't always in Wonderland? She fell down, 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 deep in a hole. Right, well, I wasn't always in room. <gasps> I'm like Alice. Now we've got a chance. I'm scared. I know. Truck. Truck. Wiggle out. Wiggle out. Jump. Jump. Run. Run. <laughs> Thanks, Lenny, for joining us. Um, 
How you doing? Yeah, not too bad. I suppose like everybody else, just kind of, I don't know, in the same routine. <laughs> Trying to make that positive and not, you know, go crazy. But yeah, all good. Yeah, good, good. Well, good to hear. It's the same for everyone, as, as, as I'm sure. Yeah. Um, well, look, thanks for joining us and um, thanks for your time tonight. We're here to talk about room, but before we kind of talk about that, like, let's go back. I suppose to the start and work our way up to that point a wee bit. Sure. Um, so Room was uh, a co-production that was made with Element Pictures. Element Pictures is a company that you've always worked with with all of your all of your major projects, right? Yeah. How did that relationship start? Uh, I mean, I'm very lucky. I knew Ed Guiney, who's the sort of who is the along with Andrew Lowe or the the founders of Element Pictures. I was friends with Ed from when we were teenagers in Dublin. I mean, from when we were about 15. Um, and then we ended up in the same university. And Ed was always the kind, we were always, both of us, fascinated with film. Um, but Ed was definitely the doer of things. So, you know, and I was the kind of talker about them. And, um, and I remember in college, Ed said, why don't we set up a filmmaking society, which we did. Um, and it's still going, actually. Um, and made, made some really small things as part of that um, and ended uh, the year we left made a short that we that was funded I think it was um, we made it for like 2,000 quid or something um, which we got we, we raised um, and that was sort of the beginning of things so I went off and did other stuff I was interested in I kind of had a kind of half flirt with an academic career and I was mm. kind of a bit of that while ed went on and founded you know worked in a couple of companies and founded his first company and then eventually element pictures and was just moving in parallel and when i came back to ireland and i started wanting to make films for real i actually initially was working with um i made a lot of commercials um mm. with a wonderful guy called johnny spears who was actually um the producer of adam and paul with ed as well and um, so ed and element were execs on that um but that relationship with Ed was was sort of very deep and and rich and long standing. So it's just been a very natural home for me. Um, and uh, you know, it, it, so yeah, that 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 relationship has been central to to mm. filmmaking. That's the that's the kind of thing in in film relationships that you you hear about quite a lot. Like the I was always aware that like the Cohen brothers, for example, have always worked with like the same crew and the yeah. same people, and you know yeah. there's a sort of a there's a, a consistency and a continuity to the to the output that comes from that. Do you think that that relationship with Element has like how fundamental has that been to to what you've been able to do? Oh, it's been very fundamental, and the discussions about you know projects and and what to do and like something like what Richard did came about because I mean Adam Paul and Garage were via the relationship with Mark. Mm. O'Halloran and Prosperity, the TV series we did together. But then um, what Richard did, Ed had read this book um, by Kevin Power, Bad Day at Black Rock. And he thought I might be interested in, he, and I read it and I wasn't sure, but he kept sort of, like he, he always has a really good nose for what I'm going to be taken by. Mm. And so eventually I kind of could see a way into the book. And I remember... I just think about how he sort of managed that because I, it took me a while to kind of commit to doing it. And at every stage, he sort of like facilitated a kind of creative engagement with the project that ultimately, by the time I got in a certain distance, I knew I was really going to make it. Mm -hmm. So I don't think without, without Ed, I, that wouldn't project would never have happened. Um, and yeah, it's been very foundational. And I think as well as at the production side of things, I've worked with a lot of the same creative people in crew as well. So Stephen Rennix, uh, composer, mm. um, on the last four features and um, uh, TV show, Nathan Nugent is editor, you know, and I, I tend to work with, I tend to work with people um, and develop long standing relationships with them. And I, it's, I think it, it gives you a certain kind of strength as a filmmaker to have those people close to you, you know, mm. and one of the bits of advice I give to, people who say what should I do I want to make films and I don't know where to start it is just and it doesn't suit everybody but if it does suit you to have more than one of you you know there's just something yeah. kind of that makes that feel real um as opposed to just kind of thinking here I am nobody knows what I'm doing nobody cares I could just stop 
mm. you know, more than one person, you can hold each other accountable and you feel like there's sort of a, I don't know, there's a center to that suddenly. And it's for me very important. Yeah. Well, it sounds like there's a security to it that's really important. You know, what, what, sure. we, what we do in the film industry is so risky and it's like, we yeah, but everything, we front load everything. Absolutely. Yeah, to have that to have that security feels really feels really comforting, I suppose. Um, when you say you flirted with an academic career, um, I mean some of the some of the writing that we, you can find on uh, on the internet about your your filmmaking is rooted in how you use representation and philosophy in in, in your work. Do you think that comes from the academic side of things? I think both both the filmmaking and the academic interest probably come from the same root, if you know what I mean. Right. So I'm not conscious of, um, I'm not conscious, I don't think um, in a sort of super abstract way when I'm making something, it is, it feels natural to me in that, or it, when it's good, it feels natural. Sometimes it feels awful and you just have to fight through that. But when it's going well, it feels natural. But I think this the sort of same instincts kind of, which are essentially analytical, but they express themselves in different ways, whether I'm, you know, when I was in that other philosophical sort of world versus mm. now. Um, but I think the root is the same. Um, and the things that I find really compelling in cinema are um, the bits where, you know, and I, particularly in the great filmmakers, where you feel that they're reaching the limits of what um, the medium can kind of handle. And, and the, there's that sense of an encounter with something deep and kind of fundamental um, and that's the philosophical instinct as well it's to get under the surface of things and um and and i think you know the ideal for me would be to unite those things more in the future and make more challenging probably less popular um <laughs> films so or, or or both it's hard to know yeah that's really interesting. Well, well, let's get under the skin of of Room then, in that sense, because Room, like in the context of this and Bridges Day events, is very important in terms of its portrayal of something that can happen to a woman. But you know, narratively and thematically, it's about well, it's about lots of things. But I wonder what is it about to you, or what you know, what's your you know what's your reading of it as a film? I mean, it's 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 interesting because. Um... I, one of the things that's interesting about this conversation is it's a, it's a long time since I've thought mm. about room. You know, it's it, you sort of move when when you've done something. There's a period afterwards where you end up talking about it a lot, and then it recedes, and other things happen. Um, so trying to sort of reconstruct it for myself, I mean, I think it's about many things, and they all interrelate, and there are different levels of description. So you can talk about it um, in terms of the sort of fundamental analysis of the parent-child relationship and the conundrum at the center of the parent-child relationship and mm. even and and most deeply the mother-child relationship which is the kind of um the the imperative to protect and also to kind of to allow for in you know in, in, a, in a situation where there isn't the kind of um uh dysfunction and kind of craziness of the situation that uh, Brie Larson's character finds herself in it's it's to introduce elements of reality of darkness of of kind of danger to allow those in in some way where the child can handle it mm. I suppose room puts that like it it magnifies that um tension at the heart of being a parent um by creating these really extraordinarily pressurized circumstances for both the mother and the child and then I think it's also, you know, it's a, it's, it's about, um, yeah. So it's about the limits of the, uh, of that kind of process of protection and also, um, letting go and, and, and allowing the child to face what is the kind of, you know, um, what are the darker aspects of life? Um, and then it's about, I suppose, you know, there are ways in which I think, I was always so interested in in this structure, you know. So I I have an interest in in you know in like unconventional shapes in in storytelling. So like you know, room is it's in two halves, which is really not what you're supposed to do. In a, in a, you know as a, you know in screenwriting one hundred and one, it'll you know you have three act structure and and the the crescendo, the most exciting bit or the the bit where the jeopardy is at its most intense is should be you know towards the end of the film and we put it right in the middle 
Mm. And that for me opened up a space afterwards where you could in a certain way disorientate the viewer so that they didn't quite know how to read the pattern after the escape. And I think within the space of disruption that that creates, you can talk about really interesting things and you can play with the expectations. So part of what the, the film is about is just, you know, how um, difficulty can uh, create meaning because there is a kind of story of, an, of necessity and, um, and kind of survival that mm -hmm. maintains a kind of, you know, uh, that gives a sense to what you're doing in your life. Yeah, yeah. But, I, but once that's gone and they're outside, there's a kind of, well, now there's just the business of being alive, you know? Yeah. I found that when I, I watched it again this weekend and I found myself picking up on, like, when I expected to see that second half again, I was able to read it in a different way. And I've, I found myself struck by, there's like a narrative progression in how um, Jack learns to walk down the stairs you yeah. know it's a big deal for him because he's never experienced stairs before and then um later on he's he's able to easily walk up and down the stairs and i find you find a sort of a gentle comfort to that um and i think i think that there's there's a gentle it's a an overall very sort of gentle portrayal of the recovery or normalization process that comes with the aftermath of of trauma like that yeah i mean it, it, it's you know it the reality that the actual sort of documentary reality of a of a case like that would be an entirely different experience i mean that's part of the genius of emma's book is to mm. is to partially use an allegorical kind of voice in in what she's doing so that um it's what makes it bearable and it's what makes it about something else so it, it's not about let me show you how awful it is it's about what can we sort of talk about using mm. this awful situation and yeah. that, that's always a de delicate line because i tend to be very kind of much of a naturalist in how i operate and i like to stay close to um as close as i can to what feels like you know real places with real people mm. um but at the same time i suppose in every film or, pro or project there is a kind of need to um do work underneath that surface that that is shaping the viewer's experience and creating a kind of series of thematic um, kind of ideas and, uh, you know, moving that dimension of, of kind of thematic stuff forward. Mm -hmm. But in Room particularly, like, there is, there is the dimension of the child's point of view and how, how, how literally to take that was one of the questions that we had when we were making it. You know, when I was tr trying to persuade Emma to um, give us the rights to it, I think one of the things I did was just talk about why I felt any approach to the storytelling in, on film that didn't, that, that, that became kind of overtly fantastical. In other words, you know, sort of showing representations of what the child saw to the adults. So, or using animation or, you know, any of those things that would show Jack's world would ultimately kind of feel like and in the way that wasn't the case in the book would feel like a cheat in, in, in the film. And so all the time we were trying to stay just on the right side of the, uh, of tumbling into a kind of infantilized way of, of, it, of, of telling the story. Mm. So Room as an adaptation then is a book, uh, a book, a book originally, but like translating that book into a film, you have to, I suppose you have to choose which, which points of view are lost or which, points of view the, the film adds i mean what you said earlier about being more naturalistic in your in your uh, in your work i think comes through a bit more in what richard did it's a very mm. naturalistic film and its approach to to those events um, yeah it must have been a very different process for room then yeah i mean what richard did is is a sort of um the, the way it works is to allow the kind of stuff to creep up through what seems like just a kind of observational like that, I think that works because what you're starting with is something which which has to feel very ordinary mm. in order for it to be powerful, in order to think, my God, what would it be like to have done that? And if there's any, if it's too heightened, then I don't think you, I don't think the, the sort of the shock or the sense of what, like the existential shift that would happen in the character wouldn't, wouldn't resonate as much. But with Room, you are in a kind of 
allegory to use that word right from the beginning in a way and yeah it did have to work in a very different way and little bits of voiceover from the boy and um and creating a kind of um i suppose the the difference between the novel and the film is and and writing generally you know in a piece of prose you are you're in a voice and you're unless it's a very modernistic piece where you shift narrators or shift you know from first person to third person or whatever you're either in the first person usually or the third person and, mm. and that kind of that does in a sense fix in a very deep way point of view and you can't just drift away from that the grammar is binary in that sense you know you're either in that voice or you're not mm. whereas in film you can actually so i think in a way you gain points of view in the film um uh you gain aspects of the mother that you can't really show in the novel and aspects of the other characters who kind of um deepen like old nick is kind of old nick from the boy's point of view in the in the novel but and and there are hints because you know of what he overhears and it's mm. very skillfully written but we can be out in the room and and look and be over with ma as she listens to what old nick says we can see her face in a way that he can't the boy can't and and i think she probably becomes it becomes more of a two-hander in the film than in the book which feels very much like it's centered on jack and so those are things film is very flexible in terms of point of view you know you can there are degrees of of it um and there are kind of ways of of it's quite plastic it's quite elastic mm -hmm. And I've, I'm always really interested in that and how you can kind of shift from from one to the other. Yeah. Well, speaking of two handers and the the language of film, um, there's another two hander that people know you for um, these days, which is a TV project um, called Normal People, which I want to move on to next. So, do you feel like the move into television is much different than than what you do in the scope of film in the first instance? Not, not now. No, I think they. I mean, I think there are there there are clear differences, right? Yeah. So, um, like one of the fundamental differences is like, um, the kind of the sort of attentional capital I think of it as that you have in each situation. So, for example, somebody goes to the cinema and they've made a decision to go out and they've bought their ticket and they sit down, and that gives the filmmaker some space to play with. Yeah, you know, you can bring somebody into a very different, um. You know, you can slow the pace down and and sort of teach people how to read the film mm. over the first few minutes, um, and you know that they're gonna you're, they're gonna give you that attention. Um, on TV, that's less so uh, because you know the remote is right there, and and there's always this fear. So uh, that's one thing that differs. Um, although I, I'll talk about that in a minute with regards to normal people and how mm. surprised I was by people's capacity to really sit with what was quite slow by television television standards. The other difference, I suppose, is just is is just purely in terms of whether it's episodic or not. I mean, mm. you know, that's a different kind of storytelling, but that's that's a that's a that's a that's a pro a proper difference that's you know built into the the shape of things. I think what you're getting at is you know what we would have thought about 20 years ago, which is that if you're making cinema, you can you can sort of you know uh, use all the muscles and and. In, in TV, you've got to kind of somehow broaden it because, you know, the concept, the sort of common wisdom was that the audience won't, you know, it's a more general audience. It's, a, mm. it's you know, so you have to sort of like make things a bit broader and a little bit more easy. Um, and there was really quite a lot, there was a lot of snobbery from film directors towards TV directors, for example. And it was always considered that t film was the director's medium, TV and theater more the writer's medium. I think all of that's gone away. Um, uh, oh, you know, it's been, it's been, everything has been shifted because of the kind of quality of, of work that's been, you know, via the cable ch channels and streamers and, and, and the kind of, you know, the world of uh, excellent television that kind of um, we all enjoyed over the last 10, 15 years. And I definitely didn't feel myself doing, I, I, I was really thinking hard about the episodic structure because that is a, a difference that you have to kind of um, uh, take seriously. But I wasn't thinking about, oh, you know, I, I should work a different way. I don't, you know, I'm not going to try and be as subtle. Um, I'm not going to think as much about it uh, visually. It'll be a bit more conventional. I didn't think anything like that. Mm. Um, and, and I think that's, you know, the best 
places to make television are the places which really encourage no um no kind of like a uh, handicap in terms of like horse racing you know you don't have to like add a weight you can um you can do it as sort of as seriously as you want they want that and, and so i don't feel there's a sort of qualitative difference having said that there's still something about the experience of being in a cinema that again is different but i suppose it's a you know the the, the differences are not in terms of a hierarchy anymore they're yeah. just you know they're just two different ways of yeah i think the playing field is definitely leveled now and certainly with cinemas being closed at the moment there's loads more power going towards what can be done through and I've been really lucky finish. because you know if i had made a film at the same point as making normal people that film would potentially still be waiting to be released yeah um and as it happens, we ended up with a kind of captive audience. I mean, we kind of sort of felt guilty, really, um, you know, to have ha having this kind of success, um, partly, I suppose, because of how, um, you know, how central the television had become in people's lives at that particular point. Yeah. Um, but it certainly, I think, added to the, that also, plus the fact that m normal people is very intimate and it's about intimacy and, closeness and for a lot of people who were finding that aspect of life cut off i think the the kind of the 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 experience of watching normal people may have had that bit more power mm. well look it's something that i wanted to talk to you about in the context of these of these St. bridges day events as well because the object the object of the look if we if we want to call it that in normal people the the way that you treat um intimate scenes and nudity um it's it's a bit it's a bit different than what we might have expected um and certainly you won a lot of praise for the way that was that that was handled um i mean what what what's your approach to what's your approach to, to, to intimacy to to scenes like that in general or do you have one yeah i mean it, it i think the approach is that it has to make sense you know as part of this of part of the whole thing you know like I had never thought very specifically about intimate scenes as a kind of category before doing this, but it was so obvious, you know, when we were facing into making this, that, that the intimacy of the novel was central, you know, the idea of this kind of deep physical connection between the two characters, the descriptions of their kind of sexual relationship and, 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 and how central that is to, to the, their story meant that that was something that was going to have to be honored on, on screen. And it's very different, right? Because um, when a writer is describing a scene in a novel, they can, the only things you see are the things they tell you, right? You know, so, so the, the, the word on the page is a kind of scalpel. It can make very careful incisions. Cameras are, okay, you can, you can, you know, decide to look this way and not that way. But at the same time, whatever you're looking at sort of pours in in an indiscriminate, you know, rush. And so bodies are present, right? And they're present in a passive way on screen in a way that on, that's not true on the page, right? Mm. Or at least that can be, it can seem passive. And I think what, what I thought a lot about was a few different things. First of all, to not think about sex scenes as a sort of discrete, um, you know, subclass of scene in the way that like in an action movie, you know, you get a second unit action director who might come in and do the explosions because that's their speciality or like it's a car chase. So let's bring out the, you know, all the kit that you use for yeah. car chases. So the idea that sex scenes are sort of like, okay, so obviously the lighting should change and, and we should jump forward in time and it should be very kind of, you know, coy and just decided not to do any of that, but to think about what was happening for the characters in those moments and to be celebratory of the experiences that they were having but also in a weird way, naive. So I sort of decided that as that the, 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 the sort of, you know, the implied, the implied filmmaker that you think you're with when you're watching something, I wanted that person to be like, just really deeply interested in and concerned for these characters. And almost like they don't know anything much about sex. It's just like something amazing is happening here. Let's look at what, what it is and let's, concentrate on the kind of interchange between the characters so continue the dramatic the kind of dialogue feeling even if there's no dialogue 
Mm. So it, it's it's not like let's do beautiful pictures and all stand back and admire them, but it's let's continue telling the story that we were telling in the dialogue that leads up to the sex scene. Let's not stop. So it's very important to me that that first big long sex scene in episode two, because like nine minutes long or something, it there's no there are no obvious time jumps in it. You know, she arrives they to his house, they go upstairs, they they talk, and then they start to become intimate. And we we didn't change. We just continue to to talk, but continue to look at that scene as it evolved without changing our perspective. I think the other thing that was really important, and I'll, maybe in a second, I'll talk a little bit about you know the the, the mechanics of and the kind mm. of organization of it, and how important that is for the actors and and the director and everybody else. But just going back inside the 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 kind of the frame again, the other thing that was important to all of us and Daisy was really and Paul really felt strongly about this as well was that there should be no um there should be sort of equality of exposure yeah you know that like very traditionally the traditional thing is to really focus on the female body and the male body is the experiencer of the female body in in like you know conventional filmmaking um and just to think of nudity as something really simple, like the human body shouldn't be, like the idea that that's kind of taboo, it is it's it isn't in, in fine art, why should it be on screen? But in order to make that read, it felt like uh, somehow it it changed, to, to see as much of Paul as you see of Daisy, changes it from a kind of, ch- changes it into like, into somewhere between life drawing and, ballet and 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 less of a kind of i don't know like, like we were so try we were so not trying to be sexy in any conventional mm. way yeah and 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 to make the nudity also oddly incidental like so um we really do apart from one shot where we just study them both together naked which felt really beautiful to us it's really like, you know, what happens to pass through the frame is just what happens to pass through the frame. The camera is not going, you know, it's not either coyly trying to hide things or kind of um, pruriently trying to show them. It's just, it's just, it's witnessing and it, it's very delicate to get that right, I think. Yeah. Because, you know, and we did talk a lot about it. Yeah. Um, well, it was strangely, like, to, 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 to talk about, which nudity you show, I suppose, mm. um, like in that way, it feels like an oddly progressive conversation, yeah. like a progressive depiction, and it's strange to think that it that it that it would be because yeah, it's, I mean, it's just our bodies, right? Yeah, and there is this taboo about male nudity, oddly, yeah. you know, um, and and we felt like, well, then we can't, you know, it's either both or no, or neither, mm. um, and I think the other thing is maybe to talk about because I think this is relevant to the moment we're in from a kind of changing consciousness about, um, about, you know, sexism and, and um, in the industry as well. It's just like how we did it. And the fact that it was, we talked, it was, it was a conversation with the actors um, the writers, me and Hetty directed the second six and and then Isha O'Brien, who's this intimacy coordinator, is really brilliant. It's a new role, you know. That's definitely something I'm interested in exploring with you because they and in, intimacy coordinators are something which in the industry we've talked we've talked more and more about in the last few years. Yeah. Um. So there was there was an intimacy coordinator involved in all this for normal people. Yeah. There was, and we talked about it early, early, and I was a bit skeptical. I sort of thought it would be somebody who would come in and, you know, one of the kind of things filmmakers would experience a lot. For example, if you're doing stunts, mm. is a lot of stunt coordinators will come in and yeah. try and get you to do like the, the the most amazing stunts because that's their thing, right? Yeah. And you're going, well, that's great, but what we're doing is this and it just needs to be this. And I think I had this terrible fear that the intimacy coordinator would come in and want to make the intimacy really like sort of fabulous in, in the <laughs> wrong way, you know? Or um, either so- that or they would be sort of a health and safety person in the... In right. the onset going oh no and 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 I thought well will this interfere with my relationship with the actors which is such a kind of the central relationship when you're making mm. so, um, so what what is an intimacy coordinator well, then, for anyone who doesn't know I mean yet? I think different they're different depending on the circumstances they probably the role is different but in our case if somebody like so Ita has developed this way of working and a kind of language around it so part of her 
brilliance is just that she sort of breaks the ice. She's she's the least kind of coy and the least euphemistic person you've ever met. She calls everything by its kind of normal biological name. And she says, so she comes in and she does a kind of workshop with crew um, to talk about like how best practice around, you know, onset nudity. That's all really useful. Okay. And then with the actors and the director, um, gives a sort of language uh, that we, and a process which allows the actors to offset away from me, just say if they're feeling anything uneasy, in any way uneasy, for example, about what's going on. That's really important because um, one of the things that happens if it's like in this case, you've got two very um, quite young actors who are very um, much at the start of their career. And then me, who's been doing stuff for quite a while. And there's always right. a fear in my mind, or I think in a lot of directors' minds, which is if I if I suggest something in an intimate scene, um, is the actor going to say yes because they don't want to disappoint me? You know? Right, yeah, okay. And, and with that in mind, as a director, I've tended to kind of, my tendency would be to edit myself to not put them in that position, right? Um, whereas with Ita, it's like, I know that there is, we are never going to do anything that anybody feels uncomfortable about. Both me and Ita are constantly saying, listen, um, we want to know, we really want to know if that's, if anything that we're doing is just doesn't feel right. Even if it doesn't feel right in the day, even if you thought it was okay in rehearsal and now we're on set and nobody's going to say, oh yeah, but you said that was okay. And now we've got like 10 minutes to go. Like it's a whole different way of talking. Yeah. Um, and and there's a back channel through Egypt for the cast, um, which makes me feel like I can say, here's how I see it. And, and nobody's going to go, oh, great. Yeah, that sounds good to me, even if they don't feel that. <laughs> um, you know, it was just, it was a really positive process. And, and, and I wouldn't do it any other way. I think it's good practice. I think it keeps actors safe. I think I'm not, you know, I think I'm pretty sensitive in terms of how I work with actors um, and I still found it useful. Mm. And there are many people who aren't so sensitive. And having an intimacy coordinator there, I think, will prevent some of the old, um, I don't know, ugliness and insensitivity and worse that has happened on sets yeah. through the whole history of filmmaking. Okay. It's such an interesting topic to talk about. Um, we don't have loads of time left. Um, how do you feel about taking some questions, Lenny? Yeah, I'd love to, yeah. Okay, Madeline, feel free to unmute and fire away when you're ready. Great. Um, hi, Lenny. Hi, Jerry. Hi, Madeline. Hi. <laughs> hi, yeah. Uh, really fascinating talk. I just wanted to go back to Room, if you don't mind. Sure. And uh, I just, um, I, I love that film. I watched it um, a while ago, and uh, I... I love the, 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 I mean, obviously Brie Larson was fantastic, but the boy was extraordinary. And I just wondered about your, um, how you worked with him, because it's not easy to work with children and to get, especially one so young and to get, you know, such a naturalistic and affecting performance out of him. And I just wondered, did it involve a lot of um, maybe improv, you know, rehearsal between you and Brie and the child? Um, just how did you achieve sure. that performance? Um, thank you. Um, it, it was all sorts of things. I sort of describe it as, you know, you go in with all sorts of ideas about how it might work with a small child, but it always ends up like I'm falling off a cliff and I'm just grabbing at branches and hoping that I'm going to grab one or two that work. And so the first, we, I met him early, obviously cast him having seen lots and lots of people. Um, and then it was just, a, it was partially it's trying to get and using whatever kind of charm you have to try and um, make that kid really trust you and feel comfortable with you. That's sort of the first thing. But even then, and then spending a lot of time with him and Brie without doing any work at all, you know, that was important. And um, so it, often what would happen would be like, I'd schedule rehearsals and then I'd invent a, a crisis and I'd have to run away and leave the two of them together for an hour, you know, where he thinks, oh, I'm not doing anything now. We're not working. So he's just goofing with Bree and that's kind of starts to build that relationship. She was brilliant with him as well. And then I, um, uh, I think uh, initially it was getting him out of the habit of kind of overplaying, which sometimes talented young kids have, you know, they, they get praised for being very, you know, for being big and funny and 
and tried to bring him back. And I remember one day him saying, you mean just, I can sort of be kind of me. And I said, that's exactly acting. That is it in a nutshell. You're kind of you and you're just shifting a little bit into this person. You're just, and so I got him to just do things like saying the words without trying to mean anything. And actually he is a natural actor. So, so what happens after a while is that really subtle elements of meaning start to creep back in and then you're in the right sort of space in terms of how big or small it is. Improv was useful to get them familiar with each other and to play around with the kinds of things that, you know, to help him find things that he would find scary that were appropriate for his age that we could then use as references when darker things were happening. But actually we stuck as much as we could to the script um, because generally speaking, improv, you need to be very skilled at it for it to not turn into, I find kind of either a bit of a mess or a kind of an arms race of irritation or whatever it is that people tend to run towards conflict when they improvise, if they're mm. not very skillful. And um, what would happen is early on, I would be just off camera and I would we would do sort of call and response where I'd say a line to him and he'd repeat it back to me. We would do that. So that was, which might seem very mechanical, but actually I'd get, I, I could somehow we'd find ways and Brie would do it as well of kind of releasing his self-consciousness by just backing and forwarding on the same line until, and then say, you know, and, and he'd have to say something really angry with her and it would come out a bit withheld because he's feeling embarrassed and we turn it into a game where I'd say it to him and I'd say, no, then you say it right back to me and we'd get, you know, it became sort of like that gamified. And then sometimes in a really extraordinary way, because he's so talented, he would, you could see him as we went on week to week, getting the hang of it more. And then you'd be in a situation where three or four lines or four or five lines would come out like he'd be in the scene, like a much, much older actor, you mm. know, there was a combination of things, but it was really, you know, what it is primarily is kind of survival and finding the methods that work. Um, you know, and and it was the most exhausting thing I've ever done. That that part of it, you know, a kid yeah. in so many scenes and such a young kid, but it was also amazingly rewarding. Great stuff. We have another question from Kelly. Um, I'll ask you to unmute Kelly. How you doing? Hello. How are you guys? Hey, Kelly. Nice to talk to you. You too. You too. Um, I have a question that is um, about the broader context, I suppose, of um, the day that's in it. Um, yeah. We've been seeing an awful lot of stuff today about the influence of women in your own life. So I was I wanted to find out if uh, what women in your life influence you on a personal level. Oh, and yeah. Your work. Um, well, I'll start with work. So I've been really lucky. I've worked with, you know, so in terms of the writers who've had the biggest impact of both being women, so Emma Donoghue and Sally Rooney, um, uh, then with Mark O'Halloran is sort of the other writer. And, um, but, but I've had really great relationships with, with um, uh, women, uh, like Alice Birch was the lead writer on Normal People. Um, and she, she was, I, have, she's, I, I seem to work very well with, I just like the vibe a lot of, of that kind of creative partnership with, uh, with women um, and then on normal people as well for the first time I worked with a female DOP Susie Lavelle and I found that really revelatory a because she's just absolutely brilliant but I think because there's just a kind of shift in the camera department you know um, because more women are in the camera department not just as DOPs but across the board and what was an extremely macho you know grouping they were like the sort of SWAT team of the film set you know they were like <laughs> all the stuff hanging off the belts and and it was a very very male orientated kind of world which i think was ultimately excluding and 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 not healthy that's changed and it's changed through the through the arrival of all these brilliant women but also because i think the men in the department have sort of it's just no longer kind of it doesn't feel it feels neanderthal to be the mm. old way now i think and i think so i think it's had a beneficial effect on both men and women on set to have more women, particularly in those departments. Um, and then um, at a personal level, yeah, I mean, very, I've, you know, my mother's a very, very strong kind of charismatic uh, woman. I've had a big influence on me. And, um, and I also, I'm just really, I'm really interested in, I'm always interested in trying to 
um, like I've, I've loved having with central character, you know, I've loved working with actresses and I've loved working with female central characters. And I mean, this leads us into a bigger question about, you know, there's a lot of debate at the moment about who's, who can tell whose stories. And I tend to want to push back very strongly. I think what we, we can't mistake the need for diversity and inclusion um, in the industry. In other words, bringing in different voices to make films, allow, you know, allowing us, uh, uh, opening as much as we can to kind of, you know, um, ethnicity, sexuality, socioeconomic background, all of those voices should be part of uh, making things that we all experience. But I don't think that should be become a kind of straitjacket that says only this sort of person should be allowed to tell this sort of story. Because I think part of the, the excitement for me of, are these collaborations with people whose experiences are different from me, um, but I but in who with whom I can feel a deep commonality. So, um, and then other people, obviously my wife, Monica is, you know, huge part of everything, uh, you know, or Kelly um, and, um, you know, uh, and I have a daughter who, who I think, I think having a daughter has changed again, my sense of what it is to grow up, watching my daughter grow up and watching the particular influences um, that bear on young girls and how dangerous and difficult that is. So yeah, I, I there, you know, I, I feel, and I, and I have other projects which have, which are centered on uh, women's experience. Um, and, and all I can say about that is like, I, I'll be judged by everybody on whether they feel truthful or not, you know. Um, but I don't think you, I, I, I think, unless we believe that people can only tell their own story, um, uh, which would be very limiting, I think, you know, let's see what comes out of all these interesting kind of um, uh, mixtures of, of voices and subjects. Yeah, brilliant. Um... Do we have any more questions? I've got uh, someone's clapping. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thanks for that. Um, while we wait for anyone who might have another question, um, what is coming up next for you, Lenny? Well, very happily, because partially, I suppose, thinking about wanting to be here, you know, not being able to work abroad as well, and, and also the pleasure of making normal people. Um, I came on board Conversations with Friends, which Element were going to make as a film. And then we all had a big dig. I wasn't involved in the film. I felt more like it was more of a television. And, mm. and when that became the decision, I sort of was very much interested in being involved. So I'm actually going to, we're going to start that in about, start prep in Belfast, actually in about six weeks. Um, Brilliant. So conversation with friends. I'm doing seven of the twelve episodes as director, but also producer, and same, sort of same. Alice Birch, Marco Halloran's involved. A brilliant, uh, some brilliant uh, writers, um, and a uh, wonderful woman called Maeve McHugh. And um, so yeah, I'll be, I'll be, we'll be doing that, which is another twelve half hours, very much part of the same family as normal people, but also mm. quite different. like normal people's slightly serious and kind of complicated uh, cousin. I would say. Um, and then I've been, I'm writing, um, um, I'm writing uh, something kind of quite sort of from my own family part history. Um, and I'm working then on another project, which is a film about an American boxer called Emil Griffith, which I've been talking about for years. Um, but I think we're getting closer. Uh, it's a story set in the 50s, 60s mm. and 70s in New York. Um, a gay black boxer called Emil Griffith, who had this extraordinarily dramatic event happen in the middle of his, well, the beginning of his career, which kind of it defined his life from then on. Um, and I, I'm reading stuff and, you know, uh, working on a bunch of things, working on a project, yes, a, a, an Irish film with Marco Halloran. So um, a, a hopefully will be our third film collaboration. It's a film set in the West of Ireland in the 1980s. Um, about a family and I think he's doing it something amazing with with the story and I'm really sort of honoured to be involved in it amazing well we look out for that at Irish Film London in years to come then Lenny it would be a good fit that's for yeah. sure <laughs> good stuff look we've got two more questions um, right. from Finola and Georgie and um, I'll go for Finola first I think you had your hand up first um, when you're ready you can unmute Finola 
Okay, great. Thanks very much. Um, I just want to ask, uh, I'm from Sligo, so I was delighted that Normal People was actually filmed largely in County Sligo. Was there any discussion about that or was it important that it was authentically in, uh, filmed on, on that location? For me, that was really important. Um, and thankfully, the BBC were very um, supportive, as were Hulu. Um, it's really interesting because Sally, right? So this, this, uh, this, this is like bursting a certain bubble. But Sally, I remember asking Sally, you know, you're from Mayo. Just as a matter of interest, why did you choose Sligo? And I love Sligo. I have a particular fondness for it, so I was delighted. But why did she choose Sligo rather than Mayo? And she said when she wrote, when she looked at the manuscript, she just didn't like seeing the word Mayo written over and over again on the, <laughs> on the page. So she decided Sligo would be better. And I thought, well, out of such random um, uh, kind of inspirational moments come, comes lovely things. So, yeah, it was very important to be in the West to shoot on uh, that beautiful beach. Um, and um, I felt it felt like a really important thing to do. And I absolutely loved it. And the people were incredibly um, welcoming to us. And there was, it's a pity because lock, you know, all of, all of this was ruined by lockdown, but there was talk of a civic reception in Tubber Curry. Um, <laughs> such was the the sort of the buzz in the town after it was released. So we we never got to do it. Maybe we'll do it when, when, when we're out the other side of COVID. Amazing stuff. Uh, Georgie, you have a question. Um, you may unmute yourself and ask. Hi. Um, Hi. Hiya. I was just wondering specifically with the room, um, whether you found that you had to compromise on your like creativity or vision when thinking about, I guess, like the commercial side of the film. Um, it's a really good question. No, I didn't feel I did. Um, uh, like one of the questions you ask yourself, I suppose, when you're when you're thinking about a project is, is it possible to make this film the way I'd like to make it? Um, you know, because there are some projects which I would, uh, you know, absolutely love to have made where I just had to say to myself, no, this, the version of it that I'd like to do is not, could never be funded. Or if it was, it would be, uh, I'd come up against huge pressure to change it. Luckily, I've never had to change anything. I've always, I've, it's always been the version I wanted. So no, I don't feel like I did. I mean, I think there are many versions of Room that you could have made, which probably would have been um, less commercial. I think there are versions you could have made which would, be, would have been more. But I sort of bought into what I felt was the kind of somewhat hopeful message of the film. It's probably the only thing I've ever made. Well, Normal People has lots of positivity in it, but up until then, Room was the most kind of uplifting thing I'd ever done because I tend to be quite sort of bleak in my in my outlook. Um, so um, that was as close to a happy ending as I think I've ever, uh, I've ever done. But I think that's what was deeply intended by Emma as well, that there is a sort of hopeful idea in it. Maybe because I just had my own, my son was about the same age as Jack. And when I read the novel, he was a baby. And um, I think that desire to believe that it is possible to kind of, you know, survive the world with all its kind of horribleness felt like an important thing for me to to con to affirm at that point in my own life mm. well that's brought us full circle back to room and it's left us on um a fairly hopeful note sorry about that lenny i know you don't like to give people too I much know. hope in your storytelling you know all my credibility's gone <laughs> uh but look at as um i said i'd try and keep you for 45 minutes i've got an hour out of you now that's brilliant I'm delighted really enjoyed it thank you so much for joining us and thank you everyone who um has joined um as participants thanks lenny thanks everyone take care everybody thanks for coming all the best Bye. And that's it from us here today. Thank you so much for listening and be sure to check us out and follow us on social media. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook and YouTube where you can keep up to date with all things Irish Film London. If you enjoy everything we have to offer for you here at IFL, definitely consider becoming a member or a champion. You can find out all the information for this on our website. A final thank you to the Irish Emigrant Support Programme and Culture Ireland who've been brilliant supporters of ours for years. Gurmila Mahagut. The Irish Film London podcast is produced by me, Neve Brannigan. We're edited by Owen Bill Cliff and our theme music is by Kevin MacLeod. Thanks for listening and we'll see you again soon.